What is up everyone and welcome to my response to your questions. This is an IMNC Q&A but it's a proper traditional Q&A where I'll answer multiple questions in the one video. As you guys know a couple of videos ago I asked you guys to comment, ask me questions, ask me anything and I'd just like to say a massive massive thank you for all the awesome questions that I received. I do have a few disclaimers and a few things to say but first off let's roll the intro, get that out of the way and then I will give you a little rundown on a few points before I start answering the questions. So believe it or not, this is actually my fourth or fifth take at this video. I was initially going to try to tackle 60 of these questions in one video. I received over 100 questions that weren't duplicates, maybe over 150. I don't even know, there's so many questions. And I've got a load of them written out in this pages document because I was going to try and scroll through the YouTube comments, but that was getting much too complicated on camera. So I've been working fairly hard on this video. And what I think I'm going to do in this video is answer 20 of the questions. 20 of the first questions. I haven't sorted them in any kind of order of relevance. They're just coming from the very first questions answered. It's the 20, the 20 first questions asked, sorry. So what I'm going to do is upload a few more Q&A videos over the next couple of weeks and they'll include the rest of the questions. I, I'll probably do 20 a turn. I just, I just talk way too much and I want to give way too detailed answers, guys. And I don't want this video to be a crazy length. Um, disclaimer number two, I will not be mentioning any of the people answered, asked the questions, sorry, in the video. So I won't be saying so and so asked blah 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 because that is also a lot of work and a little bit too much effort and you guys all know that what question what questions you asked anyway so it doesn't make any difference but whatever third really quick disclaimer i will be reading all of it off my ipad so if i'm looking down at any point or looking over or looking wherever then a massive apologies i am focused on you guys and i will try and draw my attention to the lens as much as possible one other quick thing i am now very tired after all of these attempts so hopefully this goes well i am still pretty psyched to answer all these questions right all this crazy stuff out of the way, let's just begin with the first question. Will you keep the Mac Pro hard drives? They seem overkill for the studio. This is a great question because as you guys know, the Mac Pro is going upstairs into the studio and at the moment it currently has five terabytes of hard drive storage and an SSD. Will it be staying like that? It really will not be. That is way overkill for the studio. What I really want to do is have the SSD as the boot drive with logic and everything installed and then just have a one terabyte drive to store all the audio. That is pretty much all I need. So that means I will have spare drives coming out of the Mac Pro. But considering one of those drives is coming out of the Mac Pro very soon to be put on the shelf for safekeeping, the WD Green 2 terabyte, I will be removing the two terabyte black and that is the only spare drive that I'll have out of the machine. So I'm not too sure what I'm going to do with it yet, but that is correct. I will be changing the drive configuration of the Mac Pro before it goes in the studio, as well as the general configuration of the machine. It'll be a full repurposing, so there will be a couple of things that we'll need to do, including a fresh install, so expect videos on that. Question number two, when and why did you start YouTube and how did you grow? Now, I'm not going to give a full answer. I will give you guys a rundown, but if you want to know the full answer to all of these why did you start YouTube, what inspired you kind of questions that a lot of people asked me, then search my channel for previous Q&As because I did, I think, two Q&As, one devoted to why I started and what inspired me and the other devoted to how I got as successful as I have on YouTube, which isn't that successful, but it is in this sort of small tech community of, of random tech and old Mac stuff. It is it is quite a nice position to be in at the moment when, when most of your viewers and most of the other people that you watch on YouTube are aware of your presence. Um, but to give you a little rundown, I started YouTube purely for fun. Like lots of people, I didn't ever expect to have a channel and to upload daily videos or even upload weekly videos and make it into a sort of part of my routine of life. I had a channel before, it's my natural colour, and I used to make videos for fun. Some of them were really bad, some of them were okay, and they got, you know, X amount of views. But then I decided to move to uh, a new channel, and that's this one, It's My Natural Colour. And when I started, I had about 30 subscribers. I think it was 28 subscribers that came over from the old channel to this new channel, and that was the birth of the IMNC community right there back in February 2009. And it all just kind of snowballed from there. I wanted to make one video a week to keep everyone really happy because I had, you know, maybe five or six people that were genuinely interested in my videos and I was really pleased with that. 
um, but everything grew at a rapid, rapid pace and it's kind of slowed down. My growth has actually slowed down unfortunately a little bit over the past year, but that's to be expected. YouTube has become a very, very saturated, if that's the correct word, just there's so many people out there doing it that it's really, really hard to find your footing. But luckily, I've managed to find a nice footing of, you know, 10k subs or whatever I'm, whatever I have now and um, it's a great community to be in. Um, in terms of what inspired me initially, it was literally just fun and I do elaborate much more on those previous Q&A videos. They may be a little bit out of date now, I haven't seen them in a while, but they will give you a rundown on the history and hopefully the points are, are pretty much still valid today. Plans for the future, life goals, the channel, etc. I had loads of people ask me this and I think you're going to be a little bit disappointed with my answer. In terms of my life and my life goals, I've never been one of these people that looks to the future constantly. You know, you've always got authority figures in your life that say, you know, people like teachers and stuff and they go, you should really be thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and what you're going to do next year and what you're going to be when you're older and all this. And I've never really given it that much thought. Of course, I've had random ideas in my mind of things that I thought would be cool, places where I thought would be cool to go to. And, you know, that's how I ended up going to college and that's how I ended up sitting where I am right in front of you guys today just by making cool little decisions based on oh yeah that might be fun kind of ideas um, but I have an extremely go with the flow outlook and attitude to life everything happens for a reason and I am a big believer of that a massive believer I'm not a completely everything's down to fate kind of person but I do like to think that there is someone helping me out, you know? And I, I go with the flow, and most of the decisions that I stumble around making, they, they end up really, really great. So I don't do a lot of planning at all. Now, I do plan things that are important, of course, you know. Take the Hackintosh build, for instance. I did months of planning to pull that off. Um, but in terms of my life and where I'm gonna be in five, 10, 15 years time, I don't plan. I just hope that I make good decisions. I hope I make the right decisions and I hope I'm successful in whatever I do because success isn't just important as like a recognition thing. Success is important if you want to feel, you know, if you want to feel that you've made a difference. And I like to think that I have made a difference already, especially with YouTube. Um, not so much with the other work I do because they're, they're more normal jobs, if that makes sense. But everything snowballs. That's the best way I can describe my life. And, you know, it's kind of really appropriate with the hair colour and everything. I just, I just carry on rolling around and, and everything works out fine. So that's the plan for both my life and the channel. But if you want something a little more concrete, I am not thinking of stopping the channel, um, doing any less or doing any more anytime soon. I'm just gonna keep ticking over the same as I am now and hopefully everything will be okay. Um, of course, with the natural, hopefully, improvements in quality and, and various things along the way that just happen naturally as well, which is great. So hopefully that answers the question because I know at least five people asked me about that. Very, very hard question, but I am a very go-with-the-flow person. Why do you buy most of your products secondhand slash refurbished rather than new? This is an interesting question and something that I didn't really expect to get because my channel is all based around why I make the decisions I make, you know. My channel is basically an entire document of my life and the decisions that I make revolving around technology. And I always justify the use of secondhand slash refurbished tech and products in general. Um, the big one that screams out, obviously, is the fact that it's cheaper. It is much, much cheaper. You get the same for cheaper. And you often get warranties and stuff from certain places, but also it's just, if you can save that money, then that le that frees up money for something else. And also, especially with technology, yeah, I bought this iPad brand new, for instance. This will be outdated as soon as the next one comes out. And I've paid top whack for this. So if I would have bought it second hand, then I could still probably sell it for a very similar price that I bought it and I could progress like that and get the next one and stuff like that. Whereas when you buy stuff brand new, you lose money, you lose out, you lose out on opportunities also. But there are a lot of pros to buying things brand new as well. I do buy a lot of things brand new as well as second hand. It's just easier to buy some things brand new. But second hand, some people frown upon it, but especially in this day and age with the economy the way it is and everything, a lot of people are actually accepting second hand items a lot more, which is great in one way, but kind of bad in another way um, because of 
how hard it can be to find what you want secondhand for a good price. Also, the recycling thing does come into it. One person's junk is another person's treasure, or however the saying goes. It's really nice to know that you've saved something from going in landfill, and often with stuff that I buy secondhand, I sell it again so that a third person or maybe a fourth person can enjoy it again. So you kind of feel as if you're making a little bit of a difference. It's really nice, and um, yeah, it's cheaper. I've always done it. My family is very, very good at that kind of thing. My mum and dad basically they do secondhand things for a living so I've been brought up around it and it's it's kind of I I think it's deluded to think that, that your average person like me can afford everything that I have in here brand new. It just would never ever happen. So it's the only choice I've got and hey it's a pretty happy choice that I'm happy to make. I do enjoy the way that I buy my products secondhand. Would you rather have two larger 4K monitors or three smaller 1080p monitors? If I have to choose one, then it's kind of hard because I wouldn't want either. I don't think 4K is worth it yet. I think it's you know still in its infancy and we don't need it yet. I don't even know if we'll ever need it, but I'm, I'm never that closed-minded because you know, when 480p was the latest deal, uh, you know, why would you want any more than that? So resolution is always going to increase, I guess. Um, but 4K, it has its place, okay? You know, people are buying into it. Um, let's talk about 1080p then. 1080p isn't even my favourite. My favourite resolution that I have used extensively is 1920 by 1200 which is the 16 by 10 aspect ratio equivalent of the 16 by 9 1920 by 1080. You get a little bit more screen real estate and I also do prefer the actual physical dimensions of the 16 by 10 aspect ratio. I find it a little bit more comfortable to use. Um, but there are a lot of different factors that come into play here. The triple versus dual monitor thing. I think I'll always go for triple because I'm used to it now. Um, and 1080p is alright, you know, 1080p is good. I just really do like 16 by 10. But maybe in, in an ideal world, I'd like to try 14... Uh, 1440p monitors, three of those, or four 1920 by 1200 monitors, which is something that I'd like to upgrade to um, soon-ish if I can afford to get another two of the U2412Ms. But in terms of 4K, I'm really not going to be there quite yet, guys. Have you or would you ever use Windows as your main OS? Would I ever use Windows as my main OS? Again, I go with the flow. Um, but at the moment, I am deep into Apple. And I'm into Apple because that's what I use, that's what I'm used to. I'm as used to Apple products as I am tying my own shoelaces and putting on my glasses every morning I wake up. So it's part of my daily routine, that's what I'm trying to say. So the whole thought of would you ever use a different operating system just doesn't come into my mind at all because of how ridiculously happy I am with OS X. So I may do in the future, you know, Apple could end one day and then Windows may still be around, you know, and then I would have no choice probably with support and stuff. But um, at the moment, I'm really happy with OS X and that's the OS that I choose to use. And I'm not going to get into the whys and ifs and the buts in this video because, you know, you can go on about that forever and it does spark a lot of interesting comments in the comment section from different fanboys and non-fanboys or just passionate people. Um, but have I ever used Windows as my main OS? I got my white MacBook in 2007. It's a 2007 MacBook. I got it in... Yeah, I believe I got it in 2007 or sometime back then. Before then, I did extensively use Windows, but I was so young that I don't think you can consider me, my opinion, um, kind of valid in a way. You know, being a 10-year-old using Windows as your main OS, are you really going to look at other things? You know, I was running around outside playing around and, and doing whatever, you know. I didn't really care about what computer I was using. I was always a bit geeky and I always was aware of the differences between XP and Windows 98, which was, you know, seemed to be a jump that was made during my childhood, both in school and at home. And also, as you know, when Windows Vista came out, it was a big deal, you know, what, what's, all, what's this all about? But I have used Windows, of course, before I used a Mac, but it was always a family computer, or, or even my computer. I did have computers. I'll talk about that further on in the Q&A, whether it'll be in this video or not. But yeah, I guess you can say that I did, but it's not real power computer usage, so... It's hard to say, it's it's weird talking about yourself as, wait, how old was I in? I was 12 in 2007, was I? Or was I, no, I was 13, I was born in 94, so I was 13, I think. And um, 
I don't know, that's when I got my Mac, so for as long as I've really been using computers properly, I'd say that I've been a Mac user. Question number seven is a Call of Duty question, and there is a lot of things here that are actually talking about Call of Duty. Um, are you good at blah blah blah, do you like blah blah? Um, but basically, the, if I answer the first part of the question, it'll answer the rest. Do you play Call of Duty? No, I do not. I, I, in fact, I really don't. Um, I'm not sure how popular Call of Duty is these days. I guess it is still really popular. I'm not really in college and stuff anymore, so I don't surround myself with gamers like I used to. So I don't know how popular Call of Duty still is. It was so popular when I was in school. And the only Call of Duty game that I've ever beaten is Call of Duty 1. Um, and I've I beat that on a Power Mac G4, and I nearly beat Call of Duty 2 on my PowerBook G4 when I used to carry that around with me everywhere. I had that on there, and it actually ran it pretty okay. Um, I have played Call of Duty 4, and I have played Call of Duty 5 at a friend's house, but even those are really old by today's standards, maybe six, seven-year-old games. So I have no idea, but no, I do not play Call of Duty. Question number eight, what is your favorite car? As you guys know, I do not drive, and it is n it is totally out of the question me driving at all. I cannot get a license because of uh, the various conditions that I have. I am not allowed on the road, which is totally fine. That is the law, and I would indeed be a danger on the road. It does get me down sometimes, because I am very non-mobile compared to lots of people my age, but loads of people choose not to drive. That's absolutely fine. In regards to my favorite car, I don't have one because I never think about cars. I don't have a reason to think about cars. And yes, if I was a car fanatic, it wouldn't matter if I couldn't get a license. I could still be interested in cars. I could still tinker with cars and drive them around fields and stuff, I guess. But I don't really have an interest in cars, so I don't have a favorite car. Um, I guess there are certain cars out there where I think, man, that looks nice. But yeah, I, I really don't, I don't dig cars and that may be obvious because this is the first time ever, I believe, I have even mentioned the word car on the channel. What are your plans for the server setup? Are you pushing for the free NAS box? Have you got any details? Um, unfortunately, I'm in a very go with the flow position with this as well. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I am interested in FreeNAS. I am interested in Rackman Mini ITX. All of these ideas are kind of merging around in my head at the mo at the moment, and you know I'm I'm enjoying thinking about it, but I haven't made any concrete ideas. The best thing that you can do, if anyone is interested in the server stuff, the best thing that you can do is keep an eye on the channel, keep an eye on my Twitter and things like that. If I ever have a day where I'm planning, then it's likely that I'll mention it in a video and there might be another server video to come really soon anyway, so I'll make a whole server update there. But FreeNAS is something that I've been interested in for a good couple of years now, and it's about time I got on the FreeNAS bandwagon, I think. So it's pretty safe to say that we will be exploring FreeNAS in some way, shape or form soon, but I'm not gonna give any concrete promises or anything because that is a mistake that I've often made on the channel and I, I, I don't even have any promises to make anyway I don't know what I'm going to be doing halfway through and it's firstly work there is no way I could have got through all of these questions in this video no way at all I'm so glad I've chosen to do just 20 of them question number 10 what are your thoughts on the HTC One M8 after one year unfortunately guys enter the violin I am a little bit disappointed with the HTC One M8 um, maybe that's even an understatement I may be sort of quite disappointed with the HTC One M8. It was meant to be the flagship, you know, total dog's bollocks of Android phones when it came out. You know, it's meant to be the best build quality, the fastest, this, that, and the other. Um, and I kind of enjoy using the, the One M8. I use it in power saver mode constantly, so the CPU is totally crippled, and it's still got enough power without being laggy for the things that I want to do. So, you know, it's got brilliant power. The casing is really nice, although it's not as robust as people say it is, you know. It survived a couple of drops of me, but the casing isn't perfect. I do not think it's as nice as an iPhone case. Um, but I guess being robust and being designed nicely is, is a different thing. But I'm not going to get into my phone versus an iPhone um, because that would spark too many arguments, I guess. But what I will say is Android lets me down every now and again, but so does every operating system, I guess. I don't really have any thoughts on it because I try not to think about phones. If I ever get in this rut where I want to get a new phone, it often involves a big waste of money. And at the end of the day, I am not a heavy smartphone user at all. Um, I'm not a heavy portable electronics user in any way. I choose to do everything on my MacBook Pro if I can. If I can't do it on my MacBook Pro, I'll do it on my iPad. And then as a last 
last resort, I'd do it on my phone. Yes, your phone is convenient for certain things, but the One M8 has a very subpar camera, and by that I'm being kind. The camera is crap, and I had to stop using it to film vlogs for various reasons. And I do have stability issues with SD cards and stuff constantly with my phone. Um, I, I have various problems. Um, some of them may be my fault because I don't really look after the cleanliness of my phone and stuff. I don't look after my phone at all very much. But I'm not brilliantly happy with it. I did prefer my Galaxy Note 2 experience. Would I switch back to using a Galaxy Note 2 now? No, because things have come on a lot. Um, but in regards to the actual time frame, then I much preferred my Galaxy Note 2. Um, it was a nicer experience overall. Not saying the One M8 is a bad phone. If you've got it, you may be really happy with it. Um, but I'm just not that keen and I am looking forward to getting another phone, but it will be for quite a while. I've had this for still less than a year now. Why do you not sell your SSD and change it for only one for your Hackintosh? I think that's meant to say in your Hackintosh. And do you try to use another 970? I don't really understand this question, but what I am gonna do is use this question as an excuse to talk about the Hackintosh a little bit. Part five is coming very, very soon. Yes, I'll ditch the RAID Zero, and yes, you can quote me on that, don't worry. The 960 will be working fine. This question mentions a 970. I've never done anything with a 970, so there's that. Um, yeah, the SSD and drive scenario will be changing. Watch this space, part five will be coming soon. What keeps you motivated to make content? This question was asked in various ways, shapes and forms um, a couple of times during the comment section or in the comment section. And I love this question because it's my chance to give you guys some praise and I get motivated and it keeps me motivated to do these videos because of you guys. You guys are the reason why I do these videos. If you guys didn't exist and if you guys didn't watch them, I can't stress this enough, watch my 400 video if you want to really see me, you know, passionately speak about it. If it wasn't for you guys, I could not do this. That is all the motivation I need. Couple your enthusiasm with my enthusiasm, your positive feedback with my drive to make content, and that is all of the motivation I need. It's as pure and simple as that. There's no special pill out there that you can take to become motivated to do YouTube. If you wanna crack out five videos a week, it's not the hardest thing in the world. And if, if your audience want it and they, and they carry on watching and carry on supporting you, which you guys do for me, then make them and I make them and it just works out great. That's what keeps me motivated is my audience. You guys, you're great. What is your view on digital versus analog mixers? Uh, I'm thinking about buying a digital desk. That's a good question and a question for the audio people, which is really nice. It's a nice change. Um, digital versus analog. Digital has come on a long way, and in the last few years, you have um, gained a lot of choice in terms of what digital mixers you can buy. You can not now buy a brilliant digital mixer for a thousand pounds, which is awesome. You can get a Behringer X32, one of the, the stripped back slightly models, for a, a thousand pounds. Or you could go on eBay and get a second hand um, Yamaha 01V96 or something like that second hand for around that price or even cheaper. Um, so you've got a lot of options out there in the digital world and I'm not gonna talk about one digital desk versus another, but what I will say is if you want to go digital, it's a good time to do it and there are plenty of brilliant options out there to do it now. Pros and cons, obviously you can save up a little bit more and then get your digital snake so that when you set up in your venues, if you're doing portable work, that makes your life a shed ton easier because you can run one ethernet cable and get 32 cents in returns or whatever um, for most desks. Slight downside is you will be paying another thousand pounds-ish for all of this, unless you get an X32. I'm quite an X32 fan, even though I've only used it a couple of times. Um, I have, I mainly have access to an Allen and Heath QU24, but the Digi Snakes are a little bit expensive. But I digress. It's a great time to buy them now. You can get your Digi Snake um, further on down the line. If you don't want to get one, you can still use an analog multi-core with most digital desks because they've got local preamps. It's it it all works out really well. Um, 
Analog desks still have a lot going for them. They're a lot cheaper. You'll get a lot more channels on your desk for um, for cheaper. But digital, in terms of on the road gigging, just has so many advantages. Gone are the days of racks and racks of compressors, graphic graphic EQs, gates, all of that stuff. You'll have it all built into your digi desk, and you can carry it in one hand, and it is ideal. Um, I do recommend trying out different digital desks, but in terms of analog versus digital, then either bite the bullet and go for it. I love analog, as you guys know. I love the sound, I love it. But your audience will not notice analog versus digital sound, and digital will make your working life one hell of a lot easier, including things like iPad remote apps. It's great. Um, it just works well. So that is that question well and truly answered. And I actually wrote a approximately 5,000 word essay on analog versus digital for a college assignment. And if anyone is interested, I will email it to them. Question number 14, something that I got asked one hell of a lot, and that is, Tom, what do you do for a living? I basically am now currently, um, hang on a sec, I've got a little bit of a freezing issue here. I am currently self-employed and in terms of what do I do um, as part of my company, I do everything that you guys see from day to day. If you don't watch the vlogs, then basically I gig, I do live sound, lighting, lighting design, theatre work, YouTube, it's actually part of it, computer repairs, freelance video editing, freelance this, freelance that. Um, I do all these different things that makes money, all goes into one big pot. I haven't got one job, but that's just the way I like it. It works extremely well. I'm not the richest kid on the block and I'm not, I'm definitely, I'm actually pretty damn poor guys. Um, but I'm learning how to manage my finances well and I'm getting more and more work every single day. So that is fantastic. I'm currently very busy at the moment. Um, but YouTube is a big chunk of what I do in my working week. Even though I don't see that much of a return, it's always more and more. Um, when I have a good month, that really brings up your averages and everything works out well in terms of that. And also YouTube opens up other gates for me, which is great. A lot of people get confused as to what I do, um, but I do have a part-time job, which is what confuses a lot of people. Um, I have a part-time job in the cinema up the road. I'm a cinema projectionist. I was a 35mm projectionist, a proper projectionist, um, <laughs> if I can talk any more weird. But now I actually do... Um, I do still work there on the digital side of things and also it crosses as a theatre and I am the theatre technician as well. So what's really good is I've got my self-employment but then that keeps me ticking over as well as a stabilised income because I have stable shifts from week to week which is great. And it is getting boiling in here in front of these lights and I'm struggling but we've got five questions left. I don't know why it's harder to do a Q&A video than other videos, it just is. Maybe it's the reading, maybe it's the, the scrolling through yards and yards of, of questions, I don't know. But anyway, that is what I do for a living. I do a little bit of everything and I love it. Would you ever consider using Periscope? Now, I don't actually know what that is at all. I really probably should have Googled it before making this video. Maybe I should quickly Google it now. If this is what I think it is, this streaming from your phone thing, um, are they in some kind of partnership with Twitter or something? Then yeah, that does actually look really cool. Maybe one day. Awesome. Thank you for drawing my attention to this service. Tom, whatever happened to the white 2007 MacBook? Was it sold or stored away somewhere? The MacBook 2007, along with my Power Mac G5, they both gave me £400 or £450, I can't remember. Uh, 450 each, that's right, because I had 900 pounds between the two, and that's what gave me the, the groundwork of the funds to buy my 2008 8-core Mac Pro. So I sold the MacBook, sold the G5, that gave me 900. I saved up a further 500, roughly, and bought the Mac Pro. So that was indeed sold, and um, I don't know the fate of the machine anymore, I'm afraid. I do know the person I sold it to, but I have not spoken to him in a good three years now. Question number 18 is a long question, so bear with me. What's your dream job? Do you want to spend the rest of your life doing part-time work at the cinema and doing the odd show here and there, or would you prefer to settle down into a full-time job and keep YouTube on the side? If so, what do you want to settle into? What is your life goal? 
As you guys know, this pretty much is very similar to the other question, but what's different about this question is this person is aware of what I'm doing already. My answer to that is I am currently living my dream job. I don't have massive expectations from myself because one thing I don't like to do is stress myself out. Any kind of stress related thing, I don't like. I love everything that I do at the moment. This is what I choose to do. My hobbies are my work, which to me is my dream job. Now, yes, I don't live in the middle of some really cool city. Uh, I don't have loads of cool friends and cool things that I do. But in my own little world, in my Tom Smith way, in my IMNC way, I am so happy with what I do. And even though it may not look great to some people, I'm living the dream. Every morning I wake up, I get to choose my own times, I get to choose my own everything, I basically run my own show, and I, I, I can be exactly who I want to be while doing all of the things that I love doing. I'm doing my hobbies for work, which is, to me, the best dream job ever. What obscure piece of technology have you ever owned? I have owned a few obscure pieces of technology, a few obscure retro Macs, and a few obscure computers, and also some weird gaming stuff and whatnot. Nothing that I can actually pinpoint right now, I'm afraid, and I don't really have time to think of anything. Um, but a quick search through my videos will probably reveal some of the weirder tech that I've had. But I'm not like some people out there on YouTube. I don't go out of my way to buy weird stuff. Most of the time I buy the stuff that is beneficial to me, and then I don't really see it as weird or obscure. Um, but there are a few things out there that are a bit weird, and I'm sure I'll come across a few odd things as I continue to clear out my stuff, so watch this space. Question number 20, and the final question for this particular segment of the video. What is the single tech-related item that you regret buying the most? And I was shocked to see and little celebratory close and leave that for another day. I was shocked to see um, this question was asked quite a lot. Um, I think it was asked about three or four times. Now, I am really, really, I've been racking my brains about this since I uploaded the video. For days, I've been trying to think about technology regrets. And a few things pop into my mind, but first, as an overall statement, I would like to think of myself as very well prepared when I buy my technology. I try and plan things as best as possible to get the best results. And 90% of the time, things work out really, really well. So I don't actually have regrets from the decisions that I make in terms of buying technology. But of course, there are exceptions. I guess a lot of people want to know if I regret buying my 2008 MacBook Pro. And, honest answer, honestly, do I regret it? Yes and no, at the same time. I know about all the graphical issues, I knew about all of them before I bought it, but I just had a draw. I had this massive sort of magnetic, uh, you know, attraction towards this, this MacBook Pro because of how much I loved the design. And I used it for a year solid. It performed fantastically for a year solid. Um, and I got, it, I got it at a decent deal and I really don't regret it because, man, some of those videos that I did on that, on that MacBook Pro are some of my highest viewed videos ever. And a lot of people enjoy the MacBook Pro 2008 stuff and a lot of people are asking for MacBook Pro 2008 stuff. Jess, my girlfriend, is currently using that MacBook Pro. She uses it for web browsing, music, emails, playing The Sims, all of the stuff that she does, and it's being great for her. It's absolutely fine. The odd screen problem here and there, the odd restart needed here and there when the graphics tend to mess up a little bit, but I'd say it's got a good few months left in it and it's clogging along fine, so I do not regret buying that, really. Um, what else have I got in my sort of, you know, filing cabinet of regrets in my mind? Luckily, all the regrets I have are normally based on other things in my life, um, not with technology, but one small part of me does regret spending £440 at the age of, I think I was 14, maybe, uh, to buy the iPhone 3GS when it was brand new and first out. Yes, it taught me a lot. It was my first smartphone. I really enjoyed having it. It was nice to be, you know, nice to, to have everyone go, wow, you've got the latest iPhone for ages. But that quickly wore off and, and I had uh, a further two years of the iPhone with it being, you know, old news. The 3GS man, pff, old news. And I dumped £440. When I bought that phone, that was the most expensive purchase that I ever made. And sometimes I look back and I think, man, now of all the interesting things that you could have bought at that age, you bought an iPhone. 
and you know you've got all these you know musical talents and you do all this awesome stuff with computers and you do lighting and sound and that and you pay 440 pounds for an iPhone at that age I just think what was I thinking but it's not a true regret because like I say I believe everything happens for a reason and I don't exactly miss the 440 pounds now I spent it a long time ago and I don't even know how I saved that up back then but I did I managed to and um, yeah but unfortunately the iPhone actually ended badly I believe there is a question about that in the next few questions of the Q&A but that'll be for another video on that note everyone that is the end of this segment of the Q&A now I do have one question to ask you guys if you've made it this far in the video please do me a massive favor and answer the only question that I have to ask ask all of you can you please answer it down below and that is when do you want to see the next segment of the Q&A? Do you want it to be a weekly thing every Monday? Because it is going to take me another four, five, maybe even six videos to get through these questions. Do you want to see another one this week? When do you want to see it? Do you want to see one a month? Because I could even do that. These questions will be relevant for a while. Um, let me know when you want to see it. I'm happy to make them whenever. It's easy enough for me to ping up in front of the camera and answer your questions. So let me know. And as my throat dries up once more and I do get a little bit of a headache because of these bright lights which are in front of me, but hopefully you guys can see me, I'm going to call it a day. That is it for my Q&A video. This has been Monday's video. Massive thank you for all the questions once more. Huge thank you for watching all the way through. I have no idea what the length of this video is, but hopefully it's not too crazy long. Look out for the next Q&A video. There'll be a link down in the video description and also a playlist for your convenience when everything is done and dusted in terms of these Q&As. Other than that, please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and welcome to this craziness. And of course, as always, I will see you in tomorrow's video. so much from doing a video before my little thing. <laughs> Freaking hell. Ah. Uh.